All right, so we want to think together as we are continuing our study of the end times as to what, what God is doing. And I'm particularly anxious for you to understand the nature of the New Jerusalem. And so we've been looking at the three major traits of that city. That in the center of it is the river of life. On both sides of that river is the tree of life. And the city itself is characterized by the word life. And so we've been looking at these different traits and trying to understand them a little bit. But right now we're looking at the tree of life. And it's amazing that it's not talked about a great deal in Scripture. And yet it's interesting that the Old Testament begins with the tree of life and the New Testament ends with the tree of life. So it's something rather significant. In Gen or Revelation 22.2 it says, On either side of the river in this new city that's going to be heaven is the tree of life bearing 12 fruits each month yielding its own fruit. And in a simple definition, the tree of life represents life that is from the Lord. Life that is the knowledge of the, uh, the good and evil is the wrong side of it. And that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, represents life apart from God and centers on me. And we looked at the tree of life some weeks ago. Yes. You think so? No, it's right. Yeah. No, well, no, thank you. I should have warned you. Because Kathy's gone, there's a couple of slides here you're not going to have yet. Thank you, Mike, for telling me that. And it will be there in a minute. You'll have the right notes in a minute. Just hang in there. With Kathy gone, we didn't redo these notes. So you're going to have a few things here that aren't on your notes. And I forgot that, David. Thank you. I wonder why you were chatting over there so confused. Now I understand. So there'll be a couple things, and then we'll catch up with your notes. So you'll be there in just a second. All right, so on either side of the river is the tree of life. Now, I want to think about what is the tree of life and what does it mean. And the best way I knew how to look at that was talking about <coughs> abiding in Christ. And that involves two parts. We make a deliberate and continuing choice to be vitally connected with Christ, and Christ abides in us. So experiencing the tree of life particularly Partaking in the tree of life involves these two pieces. Deliberately choosing to be vitally connected with Christ. And secondly, to abide in him in the sense that he lives in us. And I shared with you last week when we were together one of the best ways to describe this, to describe the distinction between a wedding and a marriage. And for many of us, our relationship with Christ is like going to a wedding. And as I shared with you last week, you can have a wonderful wedding, but if you're, you're not married unless you're really living in a new relationship with one another. And an awful lot of people just have a wedding relationship with Jesus. They're not really married to him. And so I want to think with you a minute about what that looks like, and the best way to describe it for me is John 15, 7 to 17. And we started looking at this last Sunday, and we didn't complete it, so that's why I tagged it on the front end of today. He says, if you remain in me. So the question is, this has to do with our daily, moment-by-moment -moment decisions that we're making God a part of everything we do. Now, some of you know, because I've told a number of you, this has been a very difficult week for Ruth and I. On Tuesday night in the wee hours, we got a call from our daughter in Virginia, and our stepdaughter tried to commit suicide. Uh, she was not successful, and uh, things seem to have settled down a bit, but we're concerned because we don't know where this is going to go. So you can either choose in a moment like that for hours in the wee hours of that morning talking to our daughter Jody, not knowing exactly what even to say because we were all in such shock. Do we make a decision to be able to rest in the Lord to realize he's the only one who can deal with issues like this? And that's what it is to abide in Christ, and it's a decision. And he, he gets very specific about what this looks like. He says if we're going to abide in him, the first thing that's going to happen is his word is going to abide in us. That's the scripture. John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will go to church. No, 
it doesn't say that, does not it? You know what's so really interesting to me? That when we talk about Christian things, so often we start there. And yet that's never where the Lord starts. Going to church is a consequence that comes much later. He says, the thing that really happens is he one who loves me will obey my teaching. And my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So this abiding in Christ, or if you will, eating of the tree of life, means that we are knowing what God has commanded and obeying it. But then he goes on and he says, the second trait of really abiding in Christ is you ask what you wish, and it will be done for you. So my question is, first of all, do we have the desire to ask? Do you really want to pray? Or is it a burden? And then if you really want to pray, are you asking God on a regular basis about what he wants you to pray for? You see, for many of us, prayer is coming into God's presence almost like he is a vending machine and say, let's see now, I want to put A, B, and put in my, my tithe and bang, he'll give me what I want. Real prayer says, no, God, I need you to tell me not only what you want me to do, but even what you want me to ask for. Yes. And then do we have the determination to ask? Have you ever been in a spot where life was so difficult, you didn't know what to ask, you didn't even want to ask, you were so numb, you didn't even know how to go to prayer? Yes. Well, in those times, the person who abides in Christ is determined to come into God's presence and to say, God, we want to be so connected with you that we refuse to not ask you. And he goes on to define this abiding in himself with the next phrase, which says, and this is to my Father's glory. John 3, 19 to 21 is a, or Ephesians 3, 19 to 21 is a prayer. And it says, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that it is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So the Christian is one who really is living to the Father's glory. And then he goes on and he says, the person who is abiding in him, who is eating of the tree of the knowledge of, or of the tree of life, is bearing much fruit, showing ourselves to be his disciples. Do you realize the problem with fruitlessness? I wonder, as you look at your life, can you point to, even in the last week, fruit that God has borne out of your relationship with him? Ideas, actions, attitudes, things that God has done, and you can say, yep, there's clear evidence that I'm inviting in Christ because I can see the fruit of it. The fifth characteristic of abiding in Christ says, As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Now remain in my love. So we're loving God. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. Now that one should cause us to take a step back. You see, it's not just obeying what God says that has to do with abiding. It's we're doing it the very same way that Jesus did it with the Father. That's the standard. It's not each other. It's God, I want to obey you just like your son obeys you. And then the seventh trait, I've told you this so that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be complete. There was a poster I had in my first church, or one of my churches, and it said, joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God. And I like that. And you see, joy is not dependent on circumstances. It's dependent on the fact that I know that God's in charge. In the eighth tree, it says, my command is this, that you love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, but a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. There's a song we sing around here a lot that I've always liked, that I'm a friend of God. Mm -hmm. You realize what an amazing phrase that is? <coughs> I am a friend of 
God, and it goes both ways. So what does it take to eat of the tree of life? That gives you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like from John 15, and that was very quick. But I want to really take some time now and think about how do we eat of the tree of life? Revelation 2.7 says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, what's the paradise of God? That's heaven. How do we partake in the tree of life? We have to be overcomers. So I want us to spend a few minutes today talking about that. What do we have to overcome? What is an overcomer? Someone who overcomes something. Duh. <laughs> well, what do we overcome? Trial. It is a life supremely loving God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's at the core, a core of what it is to be a Christian. That I supremely love God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 22 says it, Jesus is speaking, and someone comes to him and, a te and he says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So what is at the core of the Christian faith? It's loving God. Today, most people think that the Christian life is about how much God loves them. How he will fulfill my dreams, desires, ambitions, and wants, and keep me rich, happy, and healthy. And all you have to do is watch most of the TV evangelist, and that's what you'll hear. And scripture says that's not what it's all about at all. The core of the Christian life is my love for God. The Bible says that we become a Christian when God loves us, and it starts there. But living the Christian about life is about our loving him. And hear these words, singularly, I can never say that word. Sacrificially, obediently, wholeheartedly. And to be able to say, Lord, you are my supreme joy, my supreme love above everything else. It is a consuming affection for God through Jesus Christ by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when I was dating Ruthie at Westmont College, I could never get enough of her. Now, one of the dangers of being married for a longer time is we kind of take one another for granted. She's always there, or at least usually there. And the problem for all of us is that we can lose our first love for our spouse. And it grows cold and stale and ordinary. And that's really sad. And it's what happens to us spiritually. Our love for God becomes old hat. It becomes ordinary. It's not consuming so the question of spiritual health is, how much do you love God? How deeply do you love Jesus Christ? How desperately do you want the Holy Spirit to edit, grow, and deepen that very love? So if we sent you to the spiritual clinic and they hooked you up to a spiritual MRI machine, you know what they'd be looking for there? The quality of your love for God. How deep is it? How consistent is it? How consuming is it? How much do you love God? And more importantly, what do you use to determine it? So the issue of Scripture, Matthew 10, 37 says, He who loves the Father, he who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I'm embarrassed to tell you this. I think some of you could relate. There was a time I remember distinctly. When I was alone, I was thinking about the Lord. And the Lord impressed on me. And he said, John, you love your daughters more than you love me. And I love my daughters a whole lot. 
what it could not be more than I love the Lord. And that was a great time when God had to do some editing for me and say, do I have my loves in proper order? Do you understand? It was a pretty awesome statement. Or 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For Christ's love, what? Compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them was raised again. So here, here is what we are to overcome. The love of self. Now, I really want you to think about this with me this morning because this is so different than what you're going to hear in most places. You're going to find that so many people say you've got to love yourself before you can love others. That's not what Scripture said. Scripture says the problem is that we love ourselves entirely too much already. We're to overcome our love of self. Ephesians 6, 24. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And what the word undying means there is uncorruptible. Incorruptible. That my love of God cannot be diminished, dissuaded, or dealt with in any other way than to fully and focus on Him and love Him completely, undyingly. The problem is we replace God's love for our love. And in the Christian life, the whole goal is to put death to self-love aside and love for God in its place. Luke 9, 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must have a jolly good time and love himself supremely. <laughs> so you're going to find that's what you're going to hear taught in all kinds of places. Scripture says, whoever wants to be my disciple must do what? Deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Now, many people have said, what is that cross? I've always thought this definition I heard as a boy was one of the best. Here's God's will, here's my will. And when they cross, that's taking up your cross daily and following him. When your will comes in alliance with God's will, that's taking up your cross daily and following him. It has all kinds of implications. But now notice this one. This is breathtaking. John 16, 27. It says, the Father himself loves you because. Many of you have already turned the page. I want you just to think of it. <laughs> the Father himself loves you because. You would think it would say, because Jesus died for you, right? Or the Holy Spirit lives in you. Could you think of all kinds of things that would go in that blank? But here's what that verse says. So let's see it. You have loved me. So let's read the whole thing together. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me. So the Father loves us because we love Jesus Christ. Is that striking to you? 1 Peter 2, 6-8 says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, who is Christ. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. I want to give you a classic example of this. This happens to come from something I read on the internet. And it's long and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I thought it was fascinating that basically a man writes, and he writes these words. He says, God, a good, good, pardon me, good change doesn't happen when we focus on ourselves." he writes. This might be a surprise to some readers, but it's true. Satan loves to get us to look at ourselves, as well as if you look at yourself, judging yourself by your knowledge of good and evil, you will either end up congratulating yourself for your good performance, Bible calls that self-righteousness, or you will become depressed because of the guilt of failing to live up to those standards. Neither of these results is what God wants. So the writer of the article says we should not focus on or love ourselves. Now, as you know, many days in social media, people respond back. And I was intrigued by the response back. And this is what the responder wrote. I believe that we're made in the image of God, and that God is love, 
and we are loved too. And right there we have a major problem because Romans 3 doesn't say that. Um, we want to do good. Scripture doesn't say that either. Nobody voluntarily wants to be a bad guy if they have a choice. Therefore, what is the basis of your argument of saying if we look at ourselves for the answer, we would inevitably conclude that something uh, that is not what God wants. And then she, the writer goes on to say, um, the whole Christian idea is based on looking out for yourself. <coughs> You see the problem here? It goes on to write, The whole Christian life is looking out for yourself and caring about yourself and your future. You wouldn't care about going to heaven and being saved if you didn't care about yourself. You have to first love yourself to love. When you are loved, secure, and strong emotionally, you'll be able to appreciate God's love. The point you see is that if we do have the power to not need God, if we needed God to survive, to be good, where would the free will of man be? Now that should bring back a message I talked to you about about three or four weeks ago. Here again, we have a crazy idea of the free will of man. Now she ends it by saying God respects free will above all. If he did, I told you, nobody would be saved. I've been told that many of you a lot by preachers. It's all about free will. Remember what we said? Paul Funk, before he was saved, was dead. So here he is, laying on the floor. He's dead. Not that we wish it, purely an illustration. Right? Paul is dead on the floor. And God is so committed to free will, he will not in any way whatsoever impugn Paul's ability to be who he wants. So Paul's laying there dead. God is not going to do anything against Paul's will. What's going to happen? He's going to stay dead forever and go to hell. And that's really clear in it. Do you realize how foolish it is for man to have said free will, and she says it really well, um, free will is, is respected by God above everything else. Well, if she's right, Paul will never be saved because he's dead on the floor. God's not going to come in any way, affect his will, so God's going to say Paul's dead, so I'm not going to bother him. He can be dead. So what does God do? Scripture says, why Paul was dead in his trespasses and sin, God who is rich in mercy, made Paul alive. He didn't come and say, Paul, do you want to be alive? He said he made Paul alive. And in making him alive, he gave him the gift of faith, repentance, and Paul became a Christian. And that's true for every one of you. And so this idea that free will is the be-all and end-of-all is nothing. And this is a classic example of where we are. Revelation 2.7 says, To the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life. So the question is, what do we have to overcome? Revelation 2, 1-6, The angel of the church in Ephesus writes, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That's such a fascinating phrase. I don't have time today to look into it, but it's awesome. And that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Sounds really good, right? These are good people. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolodians, which I also hate. Revelations 2, 7 then, to the one who overcomes, I will give to right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So what did they overcome? A cold heart toward God. So who is going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of or tree of life as opposed to the tree of knowledge of good and evil? The one who overcomes. What do they overcome? A cold heart toward God. So I wonder today, as you're here with us, what's the nature of your heart? 
Are you duty driven, obligated, and task tyrannized? Is your Christian life all about ought, ought, ought? Augustine, who was one of the greatest fathers in the church, um, wrote this. I was astonished that although I now love you, speaking to God, I did not persist in my enjoyment of my God. Your beauty drew me to you, but I soon was dragged away from you by my own weight, and in dismay I plunged again into the things of this world. As though I had sensed the fragrance of the fair, but was not able to eat it. That is the case for so many. They come close to God, but they never eat of the tree of life. And the eating of the tree of life comes as we say, God, I love you supremely, and I want nothing else. For the person who eats from the tree of life, they are unsatisfied with a manageable, duty-defined, decision-oriented, willpower Christianity. It's not about working. They are committed to love-producing, risk-taking, all-consuming satisfaction with God. That's what they're overcoming. Anything that is the opposite of that. So Christ is cherished. He isn't just chosen. I didn't just come and say, well, I want to be a Christian. I cherish Christ. That he's the treasure, not just another task that must be done. He is desired, not just some duty. And this one is so important, I think. He's my light, not just my, my delight, not just my devotional. And I, raised, I was raised my whole life as a kid, having people say to me, week after week after week at camps and all kinds of places, if you don't have your devotions, things are not going to go well. And so for so many Christians, they divide, define abiding in Christ as having your morning devotion. And it's so much more than that. Psalm 73, 25 and 26, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 16, 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is nothing but toil and struggle. No, it says, In your presence there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Are you experiencing that? So when you wake up tomorrow morning, Monday, and you start your normal week, What's going to be prominent? Are you going to be thinking about the Lord? Or are you going to be caught up with everything until next Sunday when you wake up and say, oh yeah, Sunday I should think about the Lord. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Deuteronomy 28, 47 and 48 says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, you shall serve your enemies. Let me go back. I want you to catch that says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with what? Joyous, joyfulness and gladness of heart, you shall serve your enemies. So the question is, how is your love of God? Where is it? Are you consumed with his glory? Are you delighting in his word? Are you rejoicing in doing his will? Are you enjoying and abiding in him? You see, that's what we overcome. Anything that robs us of that. So how do you regain your first love? Well, Revelation 2.5 says to the church at Ephesus, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So the very first thing, if we're concerned about this, we're going to do a diagnosis. A diagnosis. We're going to do a spiritual lab test. Here's the verse to help you, James 1, 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So 
you look in the mirror this morning, your hair's all messed up, your teeth are all yellow. <laughs> For some of us, we didn't put our teeth in, but we were <laughs> And we don't do anything. We come just the way we are. The scripture says that's the person who has misunderstood their walk with God. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, you catch that? <coughs> looks intently and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in whatever they do. That's a tremendous promise, isn't it? <coughs> and this is what it is to eat of the tree of life. It's to look in God's word and digest it. And if we do, we will be blessed in all we do. So this looking has three ingredients. The first one is, what was I and what has God done to save me? And dear friends, this is what really grieves me these days. With so much that's taught the shallowness of our evangelism, we say, well, we never talked about this dead on the floor business, all sitting there in the chair, wonderful, nice looking man, looks so handsome with his new beard, gonna go off and serve the Lord overseas. Oh, so it must be a real privilege for God to have Paul as his child. So where's the glory of God in? God's kind of lucky to get Paul, don't you think? <laughs> but when we really understand what we are, dead in our trespasses and sins, and what God had to do to save us, it changes everything. This happened for me in my 30s. <coughs> I have told you before, my history is, uh, and this is no credit to me, it's just a fact. I was the goody two-shoes, you know that term? Mm -hmm. Don't quite know where it came from. Some of you do well in that. If you ever know where it came from, I'd like to know that someday. <laughs> anyway, I never did anything really wrong. Didn't right. smoke, didn't drink, didn't have sex outside of marriage. I was a good kid. Really a good kid. I've shared with some of you probably the greatest example of that. One day I was on the schoolyard. Substitute teacher was there. The kids were all fighting. And I happened to walk by. I was totally innocent, not involved at all. Walking by, substitute rounded me up with all the other kids. Took us to the principal's office. Walked into the principal's office, and this is true now, I'm quoting this from the principal, Great. She says, Johnny, what are you doing here? And I said, I wasn't involved in this. He said, you are dismissed. There was no question, Johnny never did anything wrong. <laughs> now, do you realize how hard it is for a person who never does anything wrong to realize what it is to need a savior? Now many of you have stories about what you have been in the past. And you're really aware of what God had to do to save you. I've got to tell you, it wasn't until I really studied Ephesians, the second chapter, when I realized what God had to do to save me. And it changed my life. Now I'm not grateful, I'm very grateful I don't have all the garbage and the hurt and the failure that so many people have that God has redeemed them out of. God didn't save me out of it. He saved me from it. And I'm grateful. I, I, I wouldn't want it any other way. But if that's been your history, sometimes it's hard for us to really comprehend what God had to do to save you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who live among them at one time gratified the cravings of the flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. Then remember, formally, you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision by those who called themselves the circumcision. And what that basically means is the Jews of that day looked on the, on the non-Jews and said, we're it and you're not. Remember at that time you were separated from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants of God's promise. You were out hope, you were out God, and you were in the world. And that's God said what you were like before you were saved. The second step of really getting your first love back is compare yourself to what you are as compared to what God says you can be. James 1.4 says, 
that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything? I wonder this morning, how do we do on that marker? We all know the blood pressure scale, right? And I can't tell you the numbers, I can never remember. But you go to the doctor and they take your blood pressure and they know where it should be, right there. And if you're in that range, then everything's hunky-dory. If it's too high, they do something about it. If it's too low, they do something about it. Do you realize what God's standard of your spiritual blood pressure is? That you'd mature, be mature, complete, not lacking anything. So where are we? Are there things in your life you need to overcome? Ephesians 4.13 says, Until we all reach unity in the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, here it is again, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You see what God's standard is? Or Ephesians 3, 19 and 20, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. It comes up over and over and over again. And the third step, if I'm going to really recover my first love, is how occupied am I with my future? Philippians 3, 12 to 14 says, Paul's writing, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. What thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is forward, ahead, I press toward the goal of to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So the first step in regaining my first love is reflecting on where I am, what has God done, how am I matching up to what he had planned for me. The second step, then, is to repent. To be able to say with true heart, I have chosen another love, God. Something in your place. I've given my time, attention, and affection to other things. I have neglected growing in my love of you. I have believed and acted on Satan's lie. Now, you may be surprised to hear me tell you what goes in that blank for me? And it was very painful to have God reveal it to me. And I had put my church in his place. His church became my mistress. And I looked to the church for my joy, my fulfillment, my satisfaction. And so what, what did God do? He split my church almost killed it. Most painful time I've ever been through to date. But in the midst of it, God revealed to me that I had put, can you imagine? His church in place of him. It's an occupational hazard. It may not be where you struggle, but we all have things we have put in place of where God is, and this is where the overcoming takes place. So we need to say, Lord, I have loved blank more than you. My health, my church, my spouse and kids, I don't know what goes in the blank for you. But this is what God is saying. If we want to partake of the tree of life, we have to overcome whatever's in that blank. I confess that this is idolatry, that it has robbed me of my wholehearted love for you. I ask that you would forgive me, cleanse me, and restore my first love to you, and keep me from falling. And then there is a third step, and it's very practical. If we really want to be restored to our first love, then we put off and put on. Let me explain what I mean. Put off means there are certain things that we stop doing. So my question is, what is stealing God's love from you? What's stealing and you say, having recognized it, I get rid of it. What does God need to do to remove whatever idol it is that's in place of him that you love more than him? What do I need to stop doing to remove this idol? And what lie do I need to stop believing that got me there? And then in its place, Scripture says, I start doing something or putting on something. What do I need to start doing to grow in my love of God? What is the opposite thing that's been, that, that's been stealing my love? What's the opposite of that? What biblical truth do I need to put into practice to counteract the lie that Satan has given me to believe? So there's some essential questions here. 
How important is it for you to eat from the tree of life? Do you really want to? Do you need to? Do you long to? And let me tell you that right at the center of the new Jerusalem and heaven is the tree of life. And do we desire to partake of it? Question number two. How important it is to me that I overcome anything that's robbing me of my wholehearted love for God. Question number three. Do I have a consuming affection for God through Jesus Christ by means of the power of the Holy Spirit? And question number four. Can you say that your greatest joy is in the Lord, His will, His presence, and His approval? So here's the verse. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So the question is, are you an overcomer? Well, to help you, there's a song that we want to play. Kyle, we're ready. And I like this, and I trust it will be your theme song.
question is, who will eat of the tree of life? Those who overcome. What will they overcome? A cold heart toward God. How will we overcome? By the blood.